Heroes by Robert Cormier, Chapter One. My name is Francis Joseph Cassavon, and I have just returned to French Town in Monument, and the war is over, and I have no face. Oh, I have eyes because I can see, and eardrums because I can hear, but no ears to speak of just bits of dangling flesh. But that's fine, like Dr. Abrams says, because it's sight and hearing the count and I was not handsome to begin with. He was joking, of course. He was always trying to make me laugh. If anything bothers me, it's my nose, or rather, the absence of my nose. My nostrils are like two small caves and they sometimes get blocked and I have to breathe through my mouth. This dries up my throat and makes it hard for me to swallow. I also become hoarse and cough a lot. My teeth are gone but my jaw is intact and my gums are firm so it's possible for me to wear dentures. In the past few weeks, my guns began to shrink, however, and the dentures have become loose and they click when I talk and slip around inside my mouth. I have no eyebrows, but eyebrows are minor, really. I do have cheeks, sort of. I mean, the skin that forms my cheeks was grafted from my thighs and has taken a long time to heal. My thighs sting when my pants rub against them. Dr. Abram says that all my skin will heal in time and my cheeks will someday be as smooth as a baby's arse. That's the way he pronounced it. Arse. In the meantime, he said, don't expect anybody to select you for a dance when it's girl's choice at the canteen. Don't take him wrong. Please. He has a great sense of humour and has been trying to get me to develop one. I have been trying to do just that, but not having much success. I wear a scarf that covers the lower part of my face. The scarf is white and silk, like the aviators wore in their airplanes back during the First World War over the battlefields and trenches of Europe. I like to think that it blows behind me in the wind when I walk, but I guess it doesn't. There's a Red Sox cap on my head, and I tilt the cap forward so that the visor keeps the upper part of my face in shadow. I walk with my head down, as if I've lost money on the sidewalk and I'm looking for it. I keep a bandage on the space my mo nose used to be. The bandage reaches the back of my head and is kept in place with a safety pin. There are problems, of course. My nose, or should I say my caves, runs a lot. I don't know why this should happen, and even the doctors can't figure it out, but it's, it's like I have a cold that never goes away. The bandage gets wet. I have to change it often, and it's hard closing the safety pin at the back of my head. I'm wearing my old army fatigue jacket, so I'm well covered up, face and body. Although, I don't know what I'm going to do when summer comes and the weather gets hot. Right now, it's March, cold and rainy, and I will worry about summer when it gets here, and if I am still around. Anyway, this gives you an idea of what I look like when I walk down the street. People glance at me in surprise and look away quickly or cross the street when they see me coming. I don't blame them. I have plenty of money. I received all this back pay when I was discharged from Fort Delta. The back pay accumulated during the time I spent in battle in France and then in the hospitals 
first in France, then in England. My money is in cash, hundred dollar bills, and twenties and tens. The smaller bills I keep in my wallet, but the rest of the money is stashed in my duffel bag, which is always with me, slung over my shoulder. I am like the hunchback of Notre Dame, my face like a gargoyle, and the duffel bag like a lump on my back. I am staying in the attic tenement in Mrs. Bellander's three-decker on 3rd Street. She finally answered the door after I'd been knocking for a while and regarded me with suspicion, not recognising me. This was proof that the scarf and the bandage were working in two ways, not only to hide that ugliness of what used to be my face, but to hide my identity. As her small black eyes inspected me from head to toe, I said, Hello, Mrs. Bellander, a further test. She didn't respond to my greeting, and I realised that she didn't recognise my voice either. My larynx, which Dr. Abrams called my organ of voice, had also been damaged by the grenade. And although I can speak, my voice is much lower now, and hoarse, as if I have a permanent sore throat. I remembered when Enrico Ruccelli in the last hospital had said about how money talks, and I began to draw out my wallet when she said, Veteran? I nodded, and her face softened. Poor boy. I followed her up the three flights of stairs, the blue veins in her legs bulging like worms beneath her skin. The tenement is small with low slanted ceilings, two rooms, kitchen and a bedroom, the bed only a cot really, but everything very neat, windows sparkling, the floor gleaming with wax, the black stove shining with polish. I glanced out the kitchen window at the steeples of St. Dude's Church. Craning my neck, I caught a glimpse between the three deckers of the neighbourhood, the slanted roof of the rec centre. I thought of Nicole Reynard, realising I had not thought of her for, oh, maybe two hours. I turned to find Mrs. Bellander with her hand out, pink palm turned upwards. In advance, she said. She had always been generous when I did her errands, and her tips paid for my ten-cent movie tickets to the Plymouth on Saturday afternoons. She'd baked me a cake for my thirteenth birthday. That was five years ago, and it seems like a very long time. Anyway, I paid her a month's rent, and she wrote out a receipt on the kitchen table. The table was covered with a red and white checked oilcloth, like the ones we had at home, until the bad times arrived. My caves moistened, and I groped my handkerchief. She handed me the receipt. It read, Tenant, in her shaky handwriting where my name should have been. That was fine with me. At that moment, I knew that I really was anonymous, that I wasn't Francis Joseph Cassavon any more, but a tenant in French town. Thank you, Mrs. Ballander testing again. You know my name, she said, responding this time. Not a question, but a statement, suspicion returning to her eyes. I thought quickly. On the mailbox, <clears throat> downstairs, I answered, guessing that her name was there, but a good guess, as she nodded her head, satisfied. Stop, litter, my place, she said her Canadian accent making the word sing, I make you stir this soup to help your cold. After she left, I went to the window and looked at the falling rain outside. I was home again in French town. I thought of the gun hidden away in my duffel bag and knew that my mission was about to begin. 
Later, I light a candle in St. Jude's Church. The smell of burning wax and the fragrance of old incense. The odours of forgiveness fill the church. I remember the days I served as an altar boy for Father Balthazar and the Latin responses I had trouble memorising. I kneel at the communion rail and say my prayers. I pray for Enrico and hope that he will finally go home and adjust to his condition, although those are terrible words, adjust and condition. Enrico is now without his legs and is also missing his left arm. Thank Christ I'm right-handed, he said. But I don't think he was really thanking Christ. I also pray for the souls of my mother and father. When I was six, my mother died giving birth to my brother Raymond, who lived only five and a half hours. My father died five years ago of a heart attack in the rub room of the Monument Comb Shop, although I always felt he really died with my mother all those years ago. I offer up prayers too for my Uncle Louis, who gave me a place to live until I joined the army. I pray, of course, for Nicole Reynard, wherever she may be. And finally, I pray for Larry LaSalle. It's hard for me to pray for him. I always hesitate before I can bring myself to say that prayer. Then I think again of what Sister Gertrude taught us in the third grade. Words she said came from the mouth of Jesus. Pray for your enemies, for those who have done you harm. It is easy to pray for those you love, she said. But it counts more to pray for those who don't love you and that you don't love. So, I offer up an Our Father and Hail Mary and Glory Be for Larry LaSalle. Then I am filled with guilt and shame, knowing that I just prayed for the man I am going to kill. Before going to bed, I stand in front of the mirror in the bathroom. My hair is a mess, as usual thin in some spots, thick in others. For some reason, my hair began to fall out in clumps my first few days in the hospital in France, and it has grown back in the same way. I apply Vaseline to my cheeks. I make myself look at my caves and the way the shape of my mouth has changed because of the dentures. I roll the dentures around in my mouth and remember what Dr. Abram said, that I should have a better fitting pair made in a few months when my gums stopped shrinking. He also gave me his address in Kansas City, where he will be in practice when he returns from the war. Great strides have been made in cosmetic surgery, Francis, he said. One of the few benefits of the war. Look me up when you've a man to. He was tall and look like Abraham Lincoln, and should practice his cosmetic surgery on himself, Enrico said. Enrico always had something to say, about anything and everything. I sometimes think that he talked so much to cover up the pain, even when he laughed, making a sound like a saw going through wood, you could see the pain flashing in his eyes. If you want to forget, Nicole, he said one afternoon, we were tired of cards and checkers. Here is what you do. He put down the deck of cards he was practising shuffling with one hand. You get out of the army and get yourself to a home for the blind. There must be a good-looking blind girl somewhere just waiting for a nice guy like you. I looked to see if he was joking. Even when he was joking, though, it was hard to tell, because his voice was always sharp and bitter, and the pain never left his eyes. You're a big hero, he said, a silver star hero. You should have no trouble finding a girl as long as she can't see your face. 
He tried to shake a cigarette from his pack of luckies, and three or four fell to the floor. A blind girl now is right up your alley. I am not a hero. Of course. I turn away in disgust. But later that night, lying awake, I wondered if I could really find a blind girl to love me. <laughs> Ridiculous. What made me think that a blind girl would automatically fall in love with just anyone at all? Forget it, I said to Enrico the next day. Forget what? His voice was a gasp from the pain in his legs that were not there anymore. He kept massaging the air that occupied the space his legs should fill. About the blind girl. What blind girl? <sighs> Never mind, I said, closing my eyes against the sight of his hand clawing the air. It's still Nicole, isn't it? He said. I did not have to answer, because we both knew it was true. It would always be Nicole Reynard. And even though I'm home from the war, I wonder if I will ever see her again.